All right, I think we can go ahead and get started uh, since we've got a good group already here and joined us. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, welcome to the virtual tour of the Integrative Genomics Building and the home of the Department of Energy's Joint Genome Institute. My name is, and DOE Systems Knowledge Base, I apologize. My name is Kevin Gifford Tinker. I'm a protocol officer at Berkeley Lab in the laboratory director, and I will be your guide today for this tour. Uh, this tour, while we would love to welcome you all on site, things keep evolving, but in the meantime, uh, we are not, currently we're not able to have you on site. So we have instead reimagined showing you some of our facilities uh, at Berkeley Lab. And this is Berkeley Lab 90th anniversary. So we are celebrating past achievements and imagining tomorrow's solutions. And today in honor of that, we're going to take a virtual tour of the Integrative Genomics Building or the Joint Genome Institute and DOE Systems Knowledge Base. So let's watch this footage. Hopefully it plays smoothly. Uh, but as we do this, here are some housekeeping notes. Everyone's cameras and microphones have been turned off. So you, uh, but we do encourage you to communicate with us using the Q&A or the chat feature. You can see those at the bottom of your screen likely. Uh, we will do our best to answer your questions live or at the very end, we'll have time for questions at the, uh, at the end of the virtual tour. Uh, we've enabled transcription of everything we say. So if you uh, require closed captioning, you should be able to turn that on or off as required or as you need. And this tour will last approximately 60 minutes, uh, including time for questions at the end. And throughout this, we will be asking you some poll questions. Uh, we like to always ask poll questions just to keep you engaged. Uh, so let me, this video is stopped. We're gonna look at this beautiful building right here as we do this poll question, as I launch it. This first one, we do this for every tour that we have. And let's go ahead. It's a little slow, there it is. All right, approximately how far away are you from Berkeley, California? Uh, less than 10 miles, up to 100, up to 1,000, up to 3,000, up to 6,000 or more than 6,000 miles away. We'll just give you a few, uh, few seconds to answer this question. No right or wrong answer for this one. Some questions later on will have correct answers. So uh, stay focused and uh, give your best guess on those ones but we've had most people responded. I'll give a few more seconds for this one. And then, all right, let's go ahead and close this poll and I'll share it. Here are the results. All right, share results. There it is. All right, 57% of you are between 11 and 100 miles away. A good portion, almost a third are less than 10, but we do have some guests that are quite, uh, quite far away from us. So um, hopefully soon you can travel to the United States or to the Bay Area and join us here and tour virtual tour in person our sites. But here we, here we go, let's begin and show you a map of Berkeley Lab's main campus. And the, the Joint Genome Institute is over here uh, on the, at this building, the newest building on site actually. And here it is again up close. So I have shown you what we, where we were going to today. I would now like to bring up and I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll bring up uh, Allison Takamura and Massey Balon. I think I pronounced your name right. I'm sorry, Massey, if I'm incorrect. That good. And I will let you all take on from here and give us a tour of the Integrative Genomics Building and um, Joint Genome Institute and Citizens Knowledge Base. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Takamura. I'm a science communicator, and so is my colleague, Massey Ballin. And hi, I'm Massey. We're part of the communications and outreach team at the US Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, as Kevin mentioned, or JGI for short. On behalf of our colleagues at the Integrative Genomics Building, welcome. Today, we're going to visit the IGB, which is located in the center of the Berkeley Lab campus, a short walk from the shuttle stop located just inside the gate. You may be wondering about the name of the building, so we're going to break it down. Integrative refers to the intersection of physics, biology, and computing. And genomics is about understanding the genes in an organism, such as you and me, including how those genes interact with each other and the surrounding environment. And here's what you're going to hear about today. The role the JGI plays in society, our areas of research, how we fit in with other groups at Berkeley Lab, how we share our data, our partners and neighbors at the IGB, and we'll also share a few stories of our research collaborations. And by the way, the image that you see on the left is our iconic JGI DNA helix sculpture that came with us to our new home here in the IGB from our previous facility in Walnut Creek, California. You'll see it throughout our tour. And as Kevin mentioned, please feel free to enter questions in either the chat or the Q&A throughout the tour. So first off, who are we? 
Well, the JGI is a national user facility focused on genome science. And what's a user facility? That means we're one of several dozen large scale facilities funded by the US Department of Energy. Our mission is to help researchers solve the world's energy and environmental challenges by providing them access to our resources. We'll tell you more about that later. But the JGI is one of five user facilities at Berkeley Lab. And the others are the Advanced Light Source, or ALS, which provides beams of X-ray light to examine the atomic and electronic structures of matter. The Molecular Foundry, which has instruments for nanoscale science and is now preparing for new quantum science. NERSC, or the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, which provides computing center services for simulation, data analysis, and machine learning. And the Energy Sciences Network, or ESNet. This is the high performance computer network for the entire DOE research enterprise and allows researchers to collaborate by managing and transferring large quantities of data. In other words, you'll notice when it's not working. So, why is one of the JGI's primary aims a focus on energy research? Because we depend on energy to maintain our lifestyles. You're attending this virtual tour on a device that needs to be charged. And we all rely on machines that are likely plugged in to wash our clothes, keep our food fresh, and entertain us. We rely on finite fossil fuels like oil and natural gas. In May, Colonial Pipeline shut down all four of its major pipelines that serve the eastern and southeastern United States, uh, shown here on the map are the pipelines, and that led up to gas shortages at several stations. So this is a challenge for a society, our society, running predominantly on fossil fuels such as oil and gas. They run out for one, and they have really harmful effects on the environment. For instance, this is an example of mountaintop removal for coal mining outside of Racine, West Virginia. But burning fossil fuel also seriously harms human health. Harvard released a study in February, which estimates that about 18% of deaths are from fossil fuel combustion. That's 8 million people dying worldwide each year, more actually than have been estimated to have died from COVID-19. So fossil fuels are Definitely not a long-term solution that's good for our health or that of the larger environment. Today, we're going to be talking about a different vision for the future, a bioeconomy. But what is a bioeconomy, you might ask? Let's have a poll. Is it a biodiverse ecosystem like a rainforest? An economy using seeds or other natural materials for currency? an economy with biology-based products, an economy that relies on ecotourism, an economic system between non-human animals, or is it something else? Write it in the chat. All right, let's launch this poll for everybody. We'll give you all a few seconds to take a guess of what you think this is. It should have just come up and good luck. And if you don't, if you think it's none of these, type it in the chat and let's, uh, we'll pull that up and, um, Maybe, uh, maybe you're right. So we'll let everyone have a guess. I think at least one person has said there may be something else. So if, you, if that was you, type it in. If you've got time, a couple of you maybe uh, have said that. Uh, but we will give you a few more seconds to answer this question. And all right, we have, all right. Ooh, there's some really good responses. Okay, let's go ahead and close this poll. And so uh, I think Allison and Massey, you can both see the chat. So there's some interesting responses. Let's go over those. But on the poll side, 69% said economy with biology-based products. Is that right? That is correct. So awesome job. And you know, a bioeconomy is kind of subject to interpretation, uh, but for the purposes of this talk, we will be defining it as an economy with biology-based mm -hmm. products. Cool. Oh, let so, me, uh, I did not share the results. Yeah. There's the results. Sorry. There we go. Very nice. I'll stop sharing now. I'll stop Ooh. sharing now. Perfect. All right. All right. Well, a bioeconomy really isn't that hard to imagine because life on Earth really runs on renewable energy the vast bulk of which 
comes from the sun, which produces way more energy than we use today. The sun feeds plants, which support other life. Living organisms also produce food, of course, and renewable materials. If we can harness these biological principles, we can live more healthfully and sustainably. For example, we can make fuel from plants and algae and harness materials from fungi for buildings. Yes, these blocks are made from fungi. Biology can also be used to make everyday products, drugs and supplements from algae and other microorganisms, which is not new, but we could do way more of it, biodegradable bottles from plant fiber and cosmetics. These would all reduce our dependence on oil and gas because these products are usually made from petroleum derived compounds. And then our modern world, even a place as urban as Times Square in New York City could be revolutionized. Our friends in other areas of Berkeley Lab are looking at harnessing and storing renewable energy from the sun and wind to replace fossil fuels and their products. And we at JGI and our scientific collaborators are looking specifically at harnessing biology to do the same. In creating a bioeconomy, we ask if biology can permeate everything we see in modern life. So that's why we at the Joint Genome Institute are studying biology to help create the foundations of a revolutionized way of living. All right. Back to the building. So we're back in front of the IGV and look, deer. We share our campus with many animals that inhabit the East Bay Hills. Turkeys are also a common sight around the lab and goat scapers are part of our fire preventative measures. Now we're going to head over to the side of the building and up to the patio. And here you can meet the residents of the IGV and also see our helix sculpture in the middle. There are 300 of us in the building working in research, data science, and operations. Most of us are staff at the JGI, like I said, a national user facility, and you'll hear where the joint part of our name comes from later on. Now, this shot was taken just after we all moved into the IGB in December 2019, and we stopped going to the lab a few months later due to COVID-19. Many of us have been working remotely as the lab continues to operate under limited capacity and staff on site are still asked to work with masks on. So just note that some of the images and videos you'll be seeing were taken before the pandemic and some were taken in the last year under current conditions and so feature people with masks. At the Joint Genome Institute, we work on deciphering the blueprints of life. For example, the blueprints of a starship show you in detail all of the pieces that contribute to the whole. A trained eye can start to guess at how it works. JGI does the same, but using genomes from ecosystems, plants, fungi, and microbial cells. And we've been using the word genome quite a few times now, so let's talk about what that actually means. DNA is comprised of four chemical letters or bases, more popularly referred to as the letters A's, T's, C's, and G's. The A's pairs with T's, the C's pair with G's, and those base pairs assemble into a unique sequence that makes up the genome of an organism. The sequence is like a book of instructions to form, in this case, a poplar tree. So how did we get started? Well, the JGI was established in 1997 when the Department of Energy combined the resources of three national labs, Berkeley Lab and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California and Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico into a single organization focused on three human chromosomes. And that's why we're the Joint Genome Institute. And why did the DOE get involved in the Human Genome Project? Well, the Energy Department and the National Nuclear Security Administration maintained the US nuclear weapons stockpile. So the DOE was investigating the effects of radiation exposure on human health. Berkeley Lab had several researchers interested in chromosome five, which contains about 6% of the human genome because of genes linked to conditions such as cardiovascular disease, colorectal cancer. Los Alamos, National Lab was interested in chromosome 16, which contains about 3% of the human genome. And studies have implicated genes on this chromosome in the development of breast and prostate cancer and Crohn's disease, among other conditions. And finally, Livermore Lab was interested in chromosome 19, 
which contains about 2% of the human genome. Genes involved in repair of DNA damage, as well as those associated with atherosclerosis and diabetes mellitus are located on this chromosome. So we started this in 97, and in 2003, we completed our contribution to the Human Genome Project. We sequenced model organisms as we transitioned from focusing on a single project. One was the fugu, or pufferfish, and its genome served as the Rosetta Stone for genes in the human genome because of its condensed genome and high sequence similarity. And this is the sea squirt held by one of our uh, former directors, and the genome was sequenced to assist with human developmental biology research. The sea squirt has a primitive, uh, primitive spinal column called the notochord and a central nervous system similar to the human spine. And then in 2004, we became a national user facility focused on an organisms relevant to DOE interests, such as environmental cleanup. So Daphnia here is like the canary in the coal mine. It serves as an environmental monitor in freshwater ecosystems. And despite its size on your screen, it's actually about as big as the equal sign on your keyboard. So today, we focus not on people, but on plants like this poplar tree and fungi, microbes like those in the guts of termites and cows, and algae that can help the worldwide research community find solutions to energy and environmental challenges. And so as we look back over nearly 25 years, the JGI has grown from being just a genome sequencing facility as we were when we worked on the Human Genome Project. We're the only nationally funded institution that focuses on environmental genomics. And today we offer researchers the opportunity to interpret the data we generate, and not only to say, where are these genes, but also, and more importantly, what do they do? That information not only helps us support the bioeconomy, but the health of entire natural ecosystems, like our rivers, mountains, and forests, and so much more. I mean, they give us so much, like clean water and air and a sense of awe. We wanna keep that going, right? Now let's turn to the building's history. So while we've been talking, we headed back downstairs to the IGB lobby. And this building is located on the site that once held Berkeley Lab's Bevatron Particle Accelerator, which enabled huge advances in our understanding of fund fundamental physics. The Bevatron was a synchrotron that could ac accelerate protons up to 6.5 billion electron volts of energy and operated from 1954 to 1993. It played a role in the discovery of the antiproton and was key to four of Berkeley Lab's 14 Nobel Prizes. The Bevatron beam was turned off for the last time in February of 1993, and the machine was demolished in 2009. So, in January 2017, Berkeley Lab broke ground on the IGB to accommodate the JGI and the DOE systems biology knowledge base, and we'll tell you more about them later. So both groups had been in off-site leased spaces, and co-locating them allowed the biosciences area to consolidate existing research initiatives in bioenergy, carbon cycling, biogeochemistry, to promote carbon modeling of gene and protein functions. Construction took roughly two and a half years, and we've sped that up considerably here. And we all moved into the building before the end of 2019, as you saw in the photo earlier. So we're heading into the lobby of the IGB now. The IGB is four stories high, occupies just over 80,000 square feet. And the IGB has received gold LEED certification for sustainable building design. Among its features, it uses just 36% of the energy of our previous facility. So let's walk over to this banner that we have. It depicts a few of the places and organisms that we help scientific collaborators and users to investigate. For example, this is Mono Lake. It's a super salty body of water that's not too far from Yosemite National Park. And we want to know what the tiny microbes who live there eat and how they recycle nutrients in the lake. We want to understand how fungi, like this spiky ball, can store fatty lipids, information that may provide clues to how we could make better biofuels. We study life at the extremes, even living in hot, in hot spring pools, like this one at Yellowstone National Park. 
Organisms that live here could be sources of new compounds and enzymes that, for example, could serve as novel tools for molecular biologists. We study sorghum, which is a plant that produces a grain kind of like wheat. It's a staple food grain for people in many countries, but we also see sorghum as a promising source of biofuel. We study mushrooms and moss, organisms that help cycle nutrients and contribute to healthy forests. We study trees for biofuel and carbon sequestration, like the poplar tree. It could be great for both of these applications because it grows so fast. At our old campus in Walnut Creek, California, we grew a poplar from about a four foot seedling, maybe about here, <laughs> to over 40 feet tall, that's like four stories tall, in just 10 years. We sequenced the poplar genome, which was the very first tree genome ever to be sequenced in 2006. And we study these microscopic organisms called diatoms. They fix carbon like plants, but also make these wonderful hard shells out of silicon, which can inspire new materials. All right, poll time. Who has the biggest genome? Is it humans, poplar trees, blue whales, Australian lungfish, or a native Japanese flower, Paris japonica? All right, let's launch this poll. Here's another one that actually has a right answer. So is it a human, poplar trees, blue whales, Australian lungfish, or the flower pears, hoponica? Japonica? Hoponica. Can you correct my pronunciation, Allison? Um, you know, I think... <laughs> okay, I well, think maybe I go one, with maybe Japonica. Both? Japonica. Japonica, okay. Let's go yeah. with that. All right, I'm not saying that's the right answer. I don't know, I just, I miss, maybe, I'm just mispronouncing it. I can, well, let's take a look and see. Uh, I think we've got a few more people that need to respond and take a guess of what you think the right answer is. Uh, and we will close this poll soon. All right, a few more seconds, everybody. Take, a, take your guess. Good distribution here. So we have at least one person has gotten the correct answer. So let's end the poll. And I will share the results. 47% picked the flower. All right. Uh, and then a good distribution of everything else. What's the right answer? All right. Well, the correct answer is Paris japonica, the flower. So let's cool. look at the genome sizes, which might surprise you. Humans have pretty big genomes, 3.1 billion or 3,100 times 10 to the six base pairs long. Poplar trees have genomes that are quite a bit smaller than humans. Theirs are about 422 times 10 to the six base pairs long. Blue whales have bigger genomes than poplar trees, 643 times 10 to the six base pairs. The Australian lungfish, good choice by the person who guessed that, was a prior record holder with a genome much, much bigger than a human's at 43,000 times 10 to the six base pairs. And the champ, at least for now, is Paris japonica. Its genome is 150 billion base pairs or 150,000 times 10 to the six base pairs long. Thanks for the poll, Allison. So now we've gone from sequencing people to sequencing organisms with energy and environmental relevance. But how do we decide which ones to focus on? JGI works with researchers around the world. Last year, we had just over 2,000 active collaborators or users. A third of that JGI's capacity is dedicated to working for the DOE Bioenergy Research Centers, which are consortiums that focus on applied, innovative research on biofuels and bioproducts. And the BRCs are spread around the country. For example, the Joint Bioenergy Institute is part of the biosciences area here in Berkeley Lab. And you should attend that tour if you want to learn more about them. The other bioenergy research centers are the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, physically located at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation at the University of Illinois, and the Center for Bioenergy Innovation at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. So to work with us, researchers first submit a scientific proposal that describes what they'd like to do. We don't provide grants, but we do provide access to our resources and expertise and the data we generate are made freely and publicly available. 
Those proposals undergo scientific review and are assessed for relevance to DOE interests in solving energy and environmental challenges. Once we've approved the proposal and the scope of work is defined and agreed upon, the JGI users ship us their samples. In the lobby, you may have seen it, is a large bay window through which you might see our research associates processing these samples and various instruments. And beyond that are lab benches, where our colleagues work on these and other projects. With three different DNA sequencing platforms, last year our instruments generated 290 trillion bases of sequence from samples sent in around the world by researchers collaborating with us. For context, a human genome is comprised of 3 billion bases, like Allison mentioned in the poll, right? So the JGI produced the equivalent of the genomes of 100,000 people on this machine. And that's about the population of the city of Berkeley, which has a population of 120,000. And sequencers come in all shapes and sizes. So here, the instrument that the arrow is pointing to is a DNA sequencer that's roughly the size of an Amazon Fire Stick, for those of you who use streaming devices. And this is NASA astronaut Kate Rubens, who used that same sequencing instrument in space a few years ago. She visited Berkeley Lab after that and returned a few weeks ago from her second tour in space. As I mentioned before, we're more than just a place that does sequencing. So some of our other capabilities to help scientists to collaborate with us include single cell genomics, which is isolating the DNA from a single cell to learn about an organism by sequencing the DNA we extract. In this video, you see a tube of cells in solution that's being individually sorted with the help of a laser beam. The cell's properties are determined by the light scatter, and all of that information is then gathered and processed by a computer. Another capability is DNA synthesis. And having the genome of an organism means we can chemically synthesize short sequences representing genes of interest that can be tested. And you may have heard this term referred to as synthetic biology. And still another capability is metabolomics, which helps researchers understand the biochemical processes going on in an organism. This helps link genes to what they do. For example, digestion. So to tell you more about this one, you'll be hearing from our colleague, Amber Galini. Thank you, Massey. Hi, everyone. My name is Amber. I'm a research assistant at the JGI, and I focus on metabolomics research. So this is me in the photo here, where I'm working with one of our instruments on the second floor lab at the IGB. So metabolomics, like you heard earlier, is the study of chemical processes involving metabolites, which are small, small molecule substrates and products of cell metabolism. So I work with a variety of different samples here at the lab, including a wide range of plant species and soil types, as well as algae and bacteria. So one major reason why we care about metabolism is because it's a way we can learn more about how plants interact with the microbes around them and the environment. So why do we care about these interactions? This is because microbiomes play a vital role in key ecosystem processes. And by studying these interactions at the small scale between plants and microbes and their genomes, this can help us gain greater insight into the larger scale processes at the ecosystem level, as well as help provide solutions to some of our most pressing environmental challenges. Some of these include transitioning to more sustainable agricultural practices and increasing the use of biofuels. The application of beneficial plant microbes in agriculture offers great potential to increase environmental sustainability of food production and lower its carbon footprint, as well as help advance biofuel development. This is great and all, but how exactly can we learn more about plant microbe interactions in a way that's easier and more efficient to study in the laboratory setting so we can see exactly what's going on? So first, in order to do this, there are first um, some several challenges we have to overcome. So first, the world is a very complex place, and there are so many complex interactions occurring in the environment, and our world is very dynamic. So in order to overcome this challenge, we need to simplify our study environment. Second, we lack a standardized laboratory study system. We have to be able to conduct experiments over and over again for reproducibility. And lastly, we also lack consistent analysis methods across the scientific community. Techniques and methods for data collection and analysis need to be identical too for a standard approach. So to address all of these challenges, our lab developed Fabricated Ecosystem Devices, or ECOFABs for short. So this is an ECOFAB in this photo here, which is a small single plant scale growth chamber 
used to analyze interactions between plants and microbes. It's about the size of a credit card, as shown in the photo on the left, and consists of a silicon-like mold bonded to a glass microscope slide. It has a large hollow chamber, as you can see in the photo here, where the plant's roots can grow. There is also a large port opening for the plant stems and two smaller ports connecting to the main chamber where media can be added and removed. So these ecofabs hold promise for replicating important microbial ecosystem processes and dynamics in a reproducible laboratory environment. Since we're not able to accurately reproduce the full complexity of natural environments, these simplified systems like the ecofabs will enable the discovery and testing of mechanisms underlying microbial ecosystems. These ecofabs will help scientists further understand the structure and function of genes and microbes and metabolites. So here is another real example of an ecofab in the lab with a plant. And as you can see, the design of the ecofab is really important. And having that clear chamber allows for additional visual analysis of the plant's root structure. You can even see in the photo here, some of the root hairs in this plant. Um, it's that fuzziness you see around the roots. In addition to studying plant microbe interactions, ecofabs can also be used in a wide range of research applications. They can be used to study root architecture using imaging instruments, the plant vascular system, spatial sampling, plant phenotyping, which involves characterizing plant traits, and can be used with a wide range of plant species, such as model crops, leafy greens, monocots, which are grass and grass-like flowering plants, and more. So here are a variety of different uh, molds for ecofabs of various sizes. Some are small, like that credit card size one shown earlier, and others like this one on the bottom left are about the size of your phone, a little bit bigger. So all of these molds uh, are used for different specialized research applications. So now I'm gonna jump into one of the experiments we're conducting using EagleFabs and briefly uh, describe an overview of what this project entailed. So the main research question we were trying to answer is what metabolites are associated with plant growth and development over time and across different plant species. So the main aim of the study was to establish a type of reference library of metabolites produced across representative plant species grown over a period of five weeks. So here are a few of the plant species that we studied. Um, Brachypodium and switchgrass on the left are types of grasses and are used as model plants for biofuel research. Then we have metacago and lotus. Those are both types of legumes and are also model plants which naturally capture atmospheric nitrogen and play an important role in carbon sequestration in soils. And lastly, we have wheat, which is a, which is a crop plant. And, we, and wheat can use this to study the elements that are beneficial for growing crops for food. As you can see in the photos here, we grew all these plants in those small ecofabs shown earlier. So here's an example um, of one of our lotus plants growing over five weeks. And you can see the growth progressing over time. At each week, we collected the spent media, which is the media inside the ecofab chamber during each week of growth. So how exactly was this process conducted? So first, this illustration, starting with week one, this illustration shows how the plant media was collected. Using a syringe, the spent media inside the ecofab was extracted and transferred to tubes for analysis. And then new media was added back into the ecofab for collection the next week. This was performed at each week as time points, so all the way through week five. And the spent media contains the exudates or the metabolites produced by the plant, which we can identify using liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry techniques. By doing this, we can uncover what compounds the plant produces during different stages of growth, and most importantly, the functions of these compounds, like whether they help promote growth, protect against pathogens, recruit soil microbes, or other functions. So as, you, as this experiment demonstrated, ecofabs can help advance microbiome science. So here's a video showing part of the sampling process um, of one of our ecofabs. And you can see the robotic arm here, lifting an ecofab from the growth chamber and transporting it to the sampling station located behind it, where the media in the, from the ecofab is collected for analysis and new media is added. And now you can see another video showing the ecofab being transported below the growth chamber to the imaging platforms located below. And you can see the ecofab being placed on the microscope on the right side, where the root zones of the plants are scanned to capture root structure and morphology.
And next, the ecofab is then transported to the left side. And then you can see in this video, the robotic arm lifting the ecofab from the microscope. And it's now gonna be placing it on this platform where a hyperspectral camera located above is used to capture images of the plant inside the ecofab from the top and sides to create a 3D image. So as you can see, the development of these ecofabs, a reproducible standardized laboratory system that are widely accepted along with common protocols and data standards will enable discovery and detailed investigations of plant microbe interactions. So here at the lab, we are super excited about how these ecofabs and these recent advancements with robotic automation will help further our understanding of the complex dynamics uh, in microbial ecosystems. So if you have any questions, please feel free to add them in the chat. Great. Thanks, Amber. So Amber just shared an example of how the JTI has added capabilities over the years and moved beyond sequencing. And we can provide much more information to researchers around the world with these capabilities all for free. So to learn more, we're now heading upstairs. Welcome to the IGB lounge on the third floor. Here at the IGB, the first two floors are dedicated lab spaces, while the third and fourth floors are where the operations and data science staff are primarily found. Roughly half of the JGI staff are software developers, data scientists, and bioinformaticians, all working to analyze or help develop tools to analyze the data generated by the labs. And just to give you a picture of how much data, think of Wikipedia. If it were an actual library, it would comprise some 2,860 volumes or about 3.8 billion words. Every week, JGI generates the equivalent of 432,000 volumes. That's 151 times the amount of data in Wikipedia. The data generated by the sequencers are converted from A, C, T's, and G's into binary for a computer. Here's a bit more detail. By decoding and assembling genomes, the DNA sequences comprised of the chemical letters A's, T's, C's, and G's of the organisms sourced from the samples, providing an intricate biological snapshot of a particular ecosystem. This information is then converted to the digital language of zeros and ones. These Oops, sorry about that. Data constituting a deep reservoir of thousands of different plant and microbial genomes are stored and managed at NERSC. As we mentioned earlier, NERSC or the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center is a user facility here at Berkeley Lab. This is their Cori supercomputer named for Gertie Cori, the first American woman and the third woman overall to win the Nobel Prize in Science for her discovery of the catalytic conversion of glycogen. And this information is made available through our data portals. Genome, the genome data portal is where all of our genome data are made available with dedicated sites for particular organisms, phytosome for plants, mycocosm for fungi, phycocosm for algae, and the integrated microbial genomes and microbiomes for, you guessed it, microbes. So what can our users do with all the data we generate? Well, for one thing, they can use the KBase platform designed for both biologists and bioinformaticians. The KBase folks are also co-located here in the IGB with us, and I'll let their director, Adam Arkin, tell you what KBase does. The fundamental idea of KBase is to make your data accessible, your data and analysis accessible, reusable, and transparent to others, um, while allowing you to advantage yourself of putting your data in the context of both reference data that we integrate from the outside and data that other people have shared with you to make that a very powerful, you know, community uh, sort of object. Thanks, Adam. And as he said, the Department of Energy Systems Biology Knowledge Base, or KBase, is a free open source software and data platform that lets researchers share and collaboratively work with others. 
JGI users can transfer their data, such as genome reads, assemblies, annotated genomes, to KBase to perform sophisticated systems biology analyses. If you want to learn more about how JGI and KBase can be used collaboratively, you should check out an episode of our Genome Insider podcast, which, has, uh, which features one such case. Also here in the IGB are members of the National Microbiome Data Collaborative. This is an initiative that supports and expands many of the efforts here at the JGI. And here's a brief clip that presents the challenge for researchers working uh, on communities of microbes or microbiomes. So the NMDC seeks to connect the microbiome research community to new data resources and with each other in a way that unlocks new possibilities with microbiome data science. The NMDC aims to form collaborative partnerships and build a computational infrastructure so that, as you can see here, the different types of data generated by multiple organizations, including the JGI, are available in standardized formats, allowing researchers to find, access, and use the information for analyses and to drive transformational discovery. Funded in 2019, the NMDC supports the long-term advancement of microbiome science by building an open, agile, and integrated data ecosystem. So, so you've, you've heard about, heard about... What, who we are. Oh, sorry. sorry about no, that, no, go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it from here. So you've heard about who we are and what we can do and the organisms we work with. Now you get to hear a few stories about our collaborations. Which story or stories you might get to hear a couple? What do you like me to tell you about? All right, so let's, we've got another poll question and here are your options. All right, so this is a choose your own adventure. What do you want to learn about? How uh, coffee led to CRISPR? What goat uh, microbes could do for biofuels? Um, how to make plant a plant more drought resistant? Is thawing permafrost per, permafrost a buffet for microbes? Uh, getting to know billions of neighbors, environmental viruses, or uh, living in a toxic wasteland with monkey flowers? These are all such a cool story. Hopefully, if we have time, and we'll see how it all rolls out. I think last time we had we did two. Did we last time? Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I think so. I think we had time for two last time. So we um, have, I'll give a few more seconds because there look like there's a winner and then the other ones may be tied. So, all right, we'll close this poll. And I think that just did it right there. All right, so one last person responded. So here we go. How to make a plant more drought resistant, one with 29% and we got a second place if there's time for how coffee led to CRISPR, if there's time. Sounds great. Okay, all right. So one of the world's most important grain crops, like I mentioned earlier, is sorghum. It's a Department of Energy flagship plant because of its potential to supply biofuels and bioproducts while being able to grow in harsh conditions. It can tolerate months of drought, though not necessarily well, and not all varieties are the same. So scientists are wondering, what genes are responsible for drought for the drought response? The team led by Professor Peggy Lameau at UC Berkeley has a five-year project funded by the DOE to determine what genes respond to drought conditions and how these conditions impact sorghum and its microbiome in the soil. Working with the JGI, they've already learned that more than 10,000 or 44% of sorghum's active genes change in response to drought stress. That's a really substantial fraction of its genome. By further investigating those genes, the team could help provide a roadmap for developing more drought tolerant sorghum varieties and even how to work with soil microbes to help those plants become more resilient. Did we think Allison got time for another or should we go on? I think so. I think we have All time right. for how coffee led to CRISPR. CRISPR it is. Uh, come on, there we go. All right, so CRISPR, 
or CRISPR-Cas9 is an incredibly powerful technology that wields genetic scissors to edit genes. Last year, Emmanuel Chapantier and UC Berkeley and Berkeley Lab scientist Jennifer Doudna won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work on developing CRISPR into the tool that it is today. But Jennifer became interested in CRISPR because of this scientist, Jill Banfield. She's a JGI collaborator and like Jennifer Doudna, a UC Berkeley professor. That'll be key for later. In the early 2000s, Jill had been investigating an acid mine drainage site, which had a pink biofilm of growing microbes. JGI helped her sequence the DNA of this community, the bacteria and the environmental viruses shown in green that infect and replicate in the bacteria. And she noticed a little understood sequence in the bacterial genomes called CRISPR. So what is CRISPR? It stands for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. But what's important to get from that is that CRISPR is a specific pattern. So if we take a bacterium, slice it open, and look at the chromosome made of DNA, CRISPR has these repeating sequences, which are the black diamonds in the picture, with variable sequences in between. Those are shown in the squares with different shading patterns. Before CRISPR was well understood, one idea that scientists had was that this was a bacterial immune system capturing bits of viral DNA signified by the red square and saving copies of those bits in the bacterial genome so that the bacteria could then recognize those viruses. Then bacteria could block incoming viruses by a biological process called RNA inhibition, where bacterial RNA blocks viral DNA. What does that mean? It's like a virus has a pair of skates and they work unless you pop a cover onto them. Viral DNA is like the ice skate blade and the bacterial CRISPR RNA is like the cover. That's RNA inhibition or RNAi for short. So in 2006, Jill Banfield was wondering, is CRISPR in her bacteria in the pink biofilm really using RNA inhibition? She wanted to find an expert close by. So she did, like so many of us would do, an internet search. She typed in RNAi UC Berkeley, and in the results popped up Jennifer Doudna, who at the time, Jennifer had never heard of CRISPR. She actually thought it was CRISPR with like with an E, you know, something that's crisp. So it just had never crossed her radar before. But she was intrigued. So she and Jill met for coffee a week later, and now CRISPR is practically a household name, revolutionizing how we edit genes. It has applications in medicine, bioproducts, biofuels, and so much more. This is one of those stories, just and it's one of my favorites, that illustrates how you just never know what will come out of basic research. And just give me one second as I remember how to uh, <laughs> how to change. Okay, so that story, it's an example of how we're key players early on in biotechnology research and part of a greater Berkeley Lab biotechnology ecosystem. We nickname this integrative biodesign at the biomanufactory. At JGI, we focus on making biological discoveries and developing ideas into technologies. We're in the discovery and development stages. But we also partner with other DOE facilities that focus on later stage research. The Joint Bioenergy Institute, or JBay, one of the DOE bioenergy research centers, which invents biofuels and bioproducts and tests them at pilot scales. The Agile Biofoundry, which works on further developing biotechnologies, and the Advanced Biofuels and Bioproducts Process Development Unit, or ABPDU, which really prepares and streamlines the scale up of technologies and products so that they can go to market. Here's a picture of some of the large tanks at the ABPDU that show how industrial their processes really are. 
the DOE has developed this whole pathway at the Berkeley Lab to support the development of the bioeconomy. So now you know about who we are and what we do. And as we wrap up our tour, here are a few key points we'd like you to remember. DNA is all around us and interpreting those sequences matters not just for human health, but for the environment and ecosystem health as well. Second, we, the JGI and everyone here at the IGB are all part of the global research community. Third, we're learning from nature and applying those lessons to industry. And fourth, as Allison pointed out in the CRISPR story, basic science can lead to breakthroughs. So if you're interested in coming to work at the JGI or if you're seeking an internship, check out these websites or you can just aim your phone's camera at the QR codes on the screen and the sites will appear on your mobile browsers. I'll give you a few seconds in case you're trying that out. And uh, Massey, I'll hop in as people do that. One of the questions Please I always like to ask is um, what kind of education would you need to work at uh, the JGI? You post these here, but it, could you maybe do a brief discussion about that? Sure. We have, uh, there is no one path to a science career, right? And we have people who are coming in who have degrees in biology, molecular biology, marine biology, who may now be doing uh, as, as their undergraduates and may have gone on to do graduate work in fields such as synthetic biology or microbiology. Mm -hmm. Some folks have moved away from the lab bench of what they started in and are now doing solely bioinformatics. So there are multiple paths. And if you take a look at some of the position descriptions, what you might notice is it's really about the skills. And you know, what if you have the skills that uh, we're interested in, please do apply. And I just wanted to add to that, we also have, I believe, physicists and software developers. Um, we have astro, we had some astrophysicists, I remember correctly. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, we, they're, wow. they're coming there, you know, there is no one path to, to come work at the JGI or to join us in the IGB. So it's all about your skills. <laughs> cool. All right, let me just quickly do couple more points and then we'll go take a look at questions. Is that, good? Cool. Is that okay? Are we good now? Okay, we shall move. So if you'd like to hear even more <laughs> about the different kinds of projects we work on, please consider joining us at our annual meeting in late August. It's going to be a virtual event and registration is free. And last but not least, if you'd like to stay informed, please do join us on these social media platforms. We're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, and we're on YouTube. And as I mentioned earlier, you should also please check out our podcasts. We have two of them. The Genome Insider podcast is hosted by Allison. And these are 15 to 20 minute episodes that highlight JGI enabled environmental genomics research. And our natural podcast is co-hosted by Allison and Dan Yudwari. And these are fireside chats that help build the natural product community. So thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, we'll take them now. And if you have more questions after this, please feel free to email us at jgi-coms at lbl.gov. Cool, thank you, Massey. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Amber. Let's bring Amber back up as she was uh, also presenting. Um, and Amber, um, did you have something you wanted to, did, was there any kind of hellos you wanna give? Yeah, just a shout out to my parents who are attending today. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, glad they're here watching. Hi. Um, all right, let's cool. Let's get into some questions that we've got. And if you have any questions, uh, type them into the chat or the Q&A and we'll do those now. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, what's the coolest research project you're working on right now? Open-ended for either any of you. Let's start with Amber because she yeah. she was she already got her attention with the eco tab. So let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, those were cool. Yeah, so yeah, here at the here at the JGI, I, I, I put, all my projects are really interesting. But I think the one of my favorites is definitely the eco fabs um, and that robotic automation instrument I show with the video. Um, we're just kind of getting that off the ground. Um, so that's a really interesting project. We're trying to scale it up to do a lot of high throughput plant plant experiments, so we can do 
that plant chamber that I showed you can hold up to, I think, 60 Eagle Fab. So we can do a lot of different plants at a time. So getting that all integrated with the imaging system has been just really cool to work on here at the JGI. Wow. That's awesome. Allison or Massey, either of you want to? I, 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 oh, go ahead, Massey. No, 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 go, go. <laughs> Um, well, you know, for sorghum, like I didn't know anything about sorghum before, but um, it it's it's a very versatile plant, and and one of the really interesting things that the JGI and our scientific collaborators are studying is how its its roots develop in concert with microbes. So how, how soil microbes affect the roots and how they help bring nutrients to it. Um, sorghum doesn't need as much fertilizer as most plants because it recruits these fungi that pr produce a lot of nitrogen for it. So it's, just, it's very interesting. And the roots, they go down so deep. I mean, it's like over six feet down. It's all so much, <laughs> so much material. Um, so that can help sequester carbon, which is really great for our climate goals. I have a soft spot for the microbiology research. It's just really the staggering amount of what we don't know yet and what we could discover that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of researchers, both on the data science side and in the labs, uh, and a lot of collaborators who are working on this project of, of just figuring out uh, we know a very, very minute fraction of the number of microbes in, on, and around the planet. And most of the ones we know about are focused on human health because we, right, they, they impact us, so we care. But there's so much more out there and figuring out what else is out there and what they're doing um, and how they impact the planet and, and the global cycles that that to me is, is just one of those really cool stories that, you know, you, you can just keep going back to it. Um, and that's some of the stuff like Allison mentioned for Jill Banfield's work uh, that led to CRISPR. There's just so much there. Cool. Well, thank you, Massey. Um, yeah, we are at time. So uh, let's, I'll give a quick wrap up. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll ask Massey or somebody to maybe do really want something really quick. It was just announced this week, right, of the, the JGI, the IGB, the building, is located on the site of the former Bevatron. And that, uh, can we do maybe a quick shout out to what was announced this week? Do you guys, I mean, I'm, this is on the spot right now, so I didn't prep you for it, but uh, do you wanna maybe mention what happened? So I believe the American Physics Society has named the Bevatron as a historic site. And uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier and, and its contributions, like I said, four out of 14 yeah. Nobel prizes uh, from uh, for your sorry, four out of fourteen of the labs prizes uh, were related back to the Bevatron. So yeah. uh, this it's that's the ground that the IGB is built on, and where we're all doing research. Cool. Just want to make sure we recognize that. So yes, this. Thank you all again. Thank you, uh, Massey. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Amber. And thank you to David on the back end who was assisting us with answering questions. Uh, couldn't have done this with all all of you all. Uh, this was awesome. Your your uh, tour is really spectacular. Um, again, this is Berkeley Lab's 90th anniversary. We're celebrating past achievements, imagining tomorrow's solutions. And we encourage you to go to berkeleylabnext90.lbl.gov. You can see that on the Zoom backgrounds above us, uh, but we will send out a link afterwards, yeah, <laughs> right up there. Um, you can join us for Learn About, Listen to Allison's podcast. Uh, there's great uh, videos. There are historical photos. If you're curious about why we're called Berkeley Lab and how that name came about, you can visit us and learn about it there. Uh, then you can also um, uh, see some of our 90 breakthroughs. We've got 90 different breakthroughs that are being posted constantly. And you can also join us for other virtual tours that we have lined up at, at other facilities or our general public uh, tour. That one has a prize. If you join that one, there's a prize if you get the most answers correct in our poll question. So come to that one as also. And we will keep doing these up through August when we celebrate August 26, I think, our culmination. So uh, is CRISPR one of the breakthroughs? Yeah, there we go. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think we are at time. And uh, thank you for joining us. And bye to Amber's parents. <laughs>